So um, to begin with, let's just look at a very uh, generic example of um, a potential problem with analyzing a correlation. So here we have the, um, the correlation between uh, the number of letters in a winning word uh, in a spelling bee, represented by the, the red line, um, and uh, the black line represents the number of people killed by venomous spiders. Now, as you can see, uh, there's a, a, a pretty close relationship between these two variables. In fact, I'm not sure if you can read it on the screen there, but it says that the correlation is 0.8, um, which is a very large correlation. So you might be blown away by this, like, wow, what is it about these variables that, you know, really um, makes sense? And the answer is nothing. Um, but this is just an extreme example of how we can be misled into thinking that um, just because two variables are correlated that they might somehow uh, inform our perspective about um, uh, a topic that we're interested in as researchers. So what I want to do today is kind of go over some of these problems in a bit more depth. Um, generally, uh, I'll give you a brief overview of the correlation coefficient, what it kind of can tell us about the relationship between two variables. Um, and then I want to go into some of the problems with correlations. Um, namely, there are, are three general issues that I want to cover, which is uh, that there are third, fourth, even fifth, however many variables that uh, can be underlying the relationship that we might not be aware of if we're just looking at a correlation. Um, there's the question of coincidence kind of like the slide I just showed you uh, previously. Um, and then there's the issue of reverse causation, which is where you might be tempted to think that one variable causes another, but it could, in fact, be the other way around. Um, and then we'll look at some solutions to these problems. Um, I don't want to go into any kind of detail right now, but you know, as we'll see, there are a few different things that we can do to address these kinds of issues using both uh, logic, um, research designs, previous literature, and, of course, um, uh, SPSS. And I'll use uh, some examples using um, existing data sets to uh, kind of flesh these ideas out in more concrete terms. So um, let's start with uh, this first item, a bit of a, uh, an overview of correlations. Um, so first of all, there's this uh, metric called Pearson's R, uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient. Um, and basically, what this allows us to uh, address is the question of whether a linear relationship exists between two continuous variables. Um, there are lots of different extensions of correlations uh, that rely on this principle where you can look at um, a continuous variable and a categorical variable, all sorts of different ways that um, this has been extended over the years, but we're, we're not so much interested in that right now. Um, for the sake of simplicity, we want to look at um, linear relationships between two variables. And, you know, basically this is what you see at the bottom of the screen. There are different types of uh, potential ways that this could um, play out. Like on, on the x-axis in each one of those six little graphs, you see one variable. On the y-axis, you see another. And um, they can form different patterns when you uh, plot them against each other. So, for example, on the... Uh, on the left-hand side, over here, you see that there's a perfect positive correlation, right? As one variable goes up, uh, as values on one variable go up, variables on the other variable also go up and end up with this nice sort of upward trajectory, right? And that's what we call a positive correlation. Um, on the other hand, you could have something resembling this graph all the way on the right-hand side, where you have, as values increase on one variable, you see that the values on the other variable, the y variable, go down. And you end up with this nice downward trajectory. That's what we call a negative correlation, right? Um, and then there's always the issue of if one variable increases, there's no discernible pattern in the other variable, right? You see here that they're just kind of all over the place as opposed to demonstrating a nice pattern. And that's, you know, that's where you just kind of see no correlation whatsoever. That's always possible. Hi, Priscilla. I'm sorry, is there a question or is, is that just someone? Okay, I'll give Okay. If uh, Dr. Duke, you could mute um, whoever that is. I'm not sure who that is, but it seems like they're on the phone. Anyway, um, there's also the issue, not just the direction of the relationship, but also the strength of it. 
So um, as you may be aware, uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient ranges from negative 1 to 1. Uh, values of uh, from 0 to 1, well, greater than 0 to 1 indicate a positive correlation, and values of 0 to negative 1 indicate a negative correlation, positive 1 and negative 1 um, indicating perfect correlation. Um, but the uh, uh, anything ranging from like you know zero to point two is uh, almost negligible. Point two to point, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, below point two is small. You don't really want to call a, a correlation of point one negligible. It all depends, but generally speaking, below point two is small. From point two to point five is considered medium, and anything above point five is large. If you see a correlation of above, above point five, it's like wow, that's really uh, you're you're onto something. Um, and uh, essentially, um, what we uh, are looking for a lot of the time is to show that, yes, there's a strong positive correlation or a strong negative correlation between two variables that you have identified as uh, important. So I don't want to say that, you know, correlations are useless. I'm, you know, the title of the talk is, you know, correlate this, right? But um, correlations are, in fact, useful. So I just want to cover... Uh, this fact. Correlations are very useful when you're running preliminary analyses. First of all, um, you typically want to establish that there is no lack of relationship between two variables. If there is no correlation, you know, that, that typically means that um, these two variables are not uh, closely related. However, there are some caveats to this. Um, they're also useful for describing the strength of the relationship. As I mentioned, um, if you see a correlation of you know, 0.9, that really tells you that two variables are strongly associated, and that's important to know. Um, correlations are also useful in establishing uh, the second point, um, test-retest reliability. Uh, and what this uh, can tell us, for example, in scale development, if you want to know that performance on a certain um, uh, a test or a certain, uh, say, personality measure, whatever scale uh, you're developing, um, you would want to know, you want to establish that people perform the same over time. So the performance at, say, you know, time one and at time two, say, a month or, or even a year later, you would want to see that those scores are highly correlated. And so that's a good way to sort of understand that the, the scale you're developing is uh, reliable. So a correlation could certainly be useful um, in that regard. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, um, correlations do underlie a lot of techniques um, used in lots of other analyses. So t-tests, regression, um, the list goes on. So um, they are definitely useful, and um, you don't want to sort of uh, forget that they even exist. Um, but there are some problems with uh, and over-reliance on correlations. Um, and even though it's tempting, we have to sort of take into consideration that there are certain um, issues, certain problems. Um, so one main problem is that you could have what's called a spurious correlation. Um, and there are two different ways that this works. Uh, one is that there could be a third variable at play uh, that if you um, were to examine that variable, it would reveal that the, the two variables that you were originally interested in actually are not uh, causally related. They're not necessarily as closely related as you may have thought. Um, and this third variable could be underlying both of them. And I'll get into some examples and details in a little bit. And the other uh, case of a spurious correlation would be if you have coincidence. So again, the number of words in a spelling bee and the number of uh, you know deaths caused by spider bites I don't think you build a case logically or, or uh, theoretically or empirically that um, that makes any kind of um, scientific or clinical sense. And then lastly, there's this uh, idea of reverse causation. Um, we'll look at some examples of this, but basically the idea is that if you think that you know eating oatmeal uh, being correlated with uh, likelihood of death um, is correlated is, is causal. You know, the more oatmeal you eat, the more likely you are to die. Well, that might be, um, in fact, the other way around. Um, even though that example might not make perfect sense, we'll look at some examples that do make better sense. Um, so, okay, let's take these one at a time. Let's look at the third variable problem. 
here we see a, a, a great example of how this works. Um, you can see that uh, in the upstairs uh, bedroom, um, the mom is scolding the son. She says, now go to sleep, Kevin, or once again, I'll have to knock three times and summon the floating head of death. And, you know, in poor little Kevin's mind, um, this suggests that the, um, uh, the knocking on the uh, floor is um, causing the, uh, the floating head of death to appear. But what we really know is that there's a third player in this scenario, the dad downstairs, waiting to release the balloon upon hearing the, uh, uh, the three knocks on the, on the ceiling. So um, there's definitely uh, no way to know if this happens if you're a little Kevin, right? But, you know, we're not naive, we're scientists, we, we can, um, you know, look at the, uh, the existing uh, literature base, think critically, etc., to think what else could be underlying certain relationships that we see in the world. So it's not necessarily just that, you know, you knock three times and a, a, a floating head of death appears, it's that there might be something else really at play. So a couple of other uh, examples. Um, this... Uh, might ring a bell for a few of us from our youths. Um, sleeping with your shoes on is positively correlated with waking up with a headache. Therefore, perhaps we can conclude that sleeping with your shoes on causes headaches. Well, if you want to type in to the chat box what other variable might be involved in that uh, scenario, please go right ahead. Um, maybe you're all thinking what I'm thinking is that well, you know, drinking alcohol is related to both of those, right? You drink too much at a party, um, you pass out with your shoes on, the next day you wake up with a headache. So clearly there's a third variable at play there. Um, and if you were to collect data, you might start to notice that pattern. Um, either anecdotal data from personal experience or, you know, maybe there's a scientific study done on this. Um, another example, as ice cream sales increase, the rate of drowning deaths increases. Therefore, eating ice cream causes drowning. Well, again, uh, in this scenario, I would be wondering if that's really the case. I mean, you know, we've all heard of uh, being uh, warned about going to swim, you know, after you eat, right? You're supposed to wait 45 minutes after you eat until you go swimming. Um, but again, swimming also has something to do with this. Eating ice cream, swimming, all these different things have to do with it being summertime, right? So um, that in reality could be underlying this relationship between uh, ice cream sales and drowning deaths. Uh, people are more likely to go swimming in the summer, so they're also more likely to drown. Um, now here's a third example, and this is from an actual study. This is you know, not just um, these kinds of basic uh, examples to get us warmed up here. Here is a real study that was conducted and they showed that the amount of art training that someone has, so you know, taking art classes, uh, uh, drawing, sculpting, uh, playing music, what have you, is significantly correlated with math SAT scores. And it's like, wow, you know, this is really tempting to start to think to yourself, you know, maybe uh, I should, uh, you know, enroll my kids in as many art classes as possible, right? Because there's something uh, really tempting here, right? Art is uh, transferring to math as a, as a, a cognitive ability. Right? Maybe you can design a treatment where our training is um, uh, administered with the hopes that uh, SAT scores on, uh, on the math portion will in, uh, increase in a, in a school setting. However, just like with these other two examples, there might be a third variable at play. Right? We don't want to jump to conclusions. The idea here is, you know, what if the kids who have more art training also have uh, parents who are really um, sort of into uh, giving them more experiences. Maybe they also have uh, enrolled their kids not only in art classes, but they've also enrolled them in math classes. Without measuring these different factors, we don't know. So the idea is uh, we really have to be careful when looking at these uh, bivariate relationships between you know, sleeping with your shoes on and headaches, between ice cream sales and drowning deaths, between art training and math SAT scores, and have to really think critically about what else could be at play. So this is the third variable problem in a nutshell. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions. I'll unmute everyone, and please feel free to, uh, to jump in. 
All right, so far so good, I hope. Um, all right, so um, again, if, if there are questions, feel free to type them in um, into the chat box, uh, and we will uh, tackle the questions as they come up. Okay, the other problem that I mentioned, right, is coincidence. So we already looked at this example of um, uh, of the, the, the length of a word in a spelling bee and the number of people killed by venomous spiders. Uh, this is a, a, a less likely of a problem um, in when, when conducting research because we typically like to think that we choose variables that are indeed somehow logically linked, right? Um, you, you, you hopefully design a study with pertinent variables in mind and there's sort of uh, background literature that informs your perspective that these variables should in fact be expected to be correlated, right? But you never know. It could just be coincidence. You could just get really lucky and find a correlation that's significant. In fact, um, when you are conducting correlational analyses, um, you may be familiar with something called the Bonferroni adjustment, which is where if you're correlating 10 different variables with each other, statistically speaking, some of those variables are just going to be correlated due to chance. Just because they're theoretically linked doesn't mean that they will be empirically linked, but it might turn out that two random variables just happen to coincide and uh, you'll see a significant correlation and say, aha, look what I found. But as we'll see, um, there are ways to um, avoid these kinds of problems. Anyway, coincidence uh, should be um, minimized wherever possible by doing good background research, looking at the literature um, and uh, learning from um, experts about how the, uh, uh, the, the variables out in the world should be expected to behave uh, when plotted against each other. Okay, now the third problem, uh, reverse causation, right? So here, um, this is where we are tempted to think of causation uh, happening in one direction between two variables, but it might be uh, the other way around. So before I used a, a pretty poor example about oatmeal, let's look at a couple of other examples. Um, the more firefighters fighting a fire, the bigger the fire. Therefore, firemen cause fires. Now, this is clearly an illogical way to think about this, right? It's, it's, it's going to be the other way around. The bigger the fire, the more fire uh, stations get called in to fight it, right? So it's the size of the fire that causes the, um, uh, uh, the number of fire trucks to be called, et cetera. Um, again, this is not super common, but here's another example. This is, again, a real study. I don't want to give these hokey examples too much. Um, the more sign language that you see in a child before it can speak, the faster verbal vocabulary develops once the child is able to speak. This is an actual empirical fact um, that Acredola and Goodwin uh, uh, discovered back in 1988 in a study. So therefore, learning sign language causes verbal language. It's actually kind of amazing. Babies can, uh, can learn sign language before they can speak. So the idea here is that, okay, you see, you teach a kid sign language, before they can talk, and then you see later down the line that they have um, uh, uh, a higher vocabulary sooner than uh, their peers. The problem here, it's very tempting, right? Very tempting to say, well, duh, of course the sign language caused verbal vocabulary to develop faster. They have all this practice with, you know, learning words, just using their hands, etc. But what this study didn't do and, and the authors themselves acknowledge this in, in the discussion section, is that um, it's possible that verbal ability, some kind of innate verbal language ability, causes sign language to be acquired. And it just so happens that motor control of hands is easier than motor control of vocal cords, the tongue, the lips, everything. So the, uh, the actual relationship could be that this... Um, this verbal ability causes better sign language. So, um, you know, again, without measuring that innate verbal ability, which is obviously going to be very difficult to do, um, you can't conclude that the, the causal relationship is going from sign language to verbal language, even though, you know, you can make a pretty strong case. 
Um, okay, but so that's that's reverse causation. So again, you see that you've got these uh, these two variables. In this case, you've got two variables, and sometimes it can be tempting to make certain conclusions about them, but we have to be very careful. Now, what can be done about this? Luckily, we're not you know um, at a dead end here. There's a few different things that we can do. Um, first of all, let me let me talk a little bit about um, the logic of extending correlational findings. Um, you can make causal claims based on correlational models, but you have to fulfill a few different assumptions. Um, so one of them is that the predictor variable, the one that you, uh, as you know, an expert in your field, determine is the, the causal variable, the predictor variable, it has to precede the outcome variable, also called the dependent variable, in time. So um, again, for example, in um, in this sign language study, uh, we can we can start to say, okay, well, sign language comes first, and verbal language comes second. So therefore, um, the the sign language causes um, verbal language to uh, to um, increase vocabulary, verbal vocabulary to increase. Um, the, the second piece of the puzzle, though, is that you have to have what's called concomitant variation of the predictor and outcome variable. This means that when you look at the previous literature, when you look at your own data, you can see that they are, in fact, consistently correlated and in the same direction. So the, the, more, um, uh, the more sign language, the more verbal language, um, or uh, you know, the, the more of one variable, the less of the other variable, and consistently. Right? So that kind of also, again, hints that when in the presence of one variable, the other appears. In the absence of one variable, the other disappears. And that's very important for establishing the, the sort of link between them. You know, you flip the light switch on, light turns on. If you flip the light switch off and the light doesn't turn off, well, does the light switch cause the light to turn on or off? Possibly not. Okay. And the third part, this is the most important part here that sources of spurious correlation have been eliminated. And so again, we're talking about the third variable problem, right? We're talking about uh, something that is within our power to measure. Um, and this is where uh, we're going to focus our energy um, for the rest of the uh, presentation. So I, I can't uh, sort of overstate the importance of this, um, this idea of the third variable, also called the uh, a spurious correlation that may exist. So. Um, how do we deal with spurious correlations? Well, I'll give you another example of a study. Um, and this, this is a very recent study, in fact. And this is kind of uh, shocking if you, if you look at like a headline in the, in the popular media. Um, these authors, uh, Enyo, Nisen, and Marta Kane, and I'm probably butchering those. They're from a, a, one of the Scandinavian countries. I forget which one. But anyway. Um, they found that those who become fathers at younger ages die younger, okay? So age at fatherhood is positively correlated with age at death. The younger you are when you become a father, the younger you're going to die. Oh, my gosh. So um, what could be happening here, right? When we look at our criteria, we can see that the predictor – can we say that, it, you know, the younger – the age at which you become a father um, – is causally related to the age at which you die, and therefore should you delay becoming a father, right, so that you live longer if that's, you know, what um, your life goals are. So the, the predictor variable, age at, at becoming a father, it does precede the outcome variable in time, right? Obviously, you've got, you, you have to um, have a child. Uh, if you're dead, you can't have a child, right? So you're going to become a father before you're going to die. Um, and there is concomitant variation of the predictor and outcome variable. Their data confirmed the correlation, right? But then the last question is, have sources of spurious correlation been eliminated? What if it's not the age at which you become a father? What if it's risk-taking personality traits when you're younger, right? That third variable problem. What if it's something else? If that's the case, then the original correlation that, that, that kind of, you know, pops out in the headline becomes spurious because you found a, a, a more um, reasonable underlying cause for that correlation. So on one hand, you might think to yourself, okay, let's start a study out, not, not really worth much. 
but these authors did something very, very uh, scientifically rigorous. And what they did is they reviewed the previous literature to look for any potential third factors. So here you can see, there's, you know, I'm just sort of, I copy pasted the text of their study from, from page two. And what you see is that um, the controlled education level, because of its close links with both fertility timing and mortality. Okay, so they figured out that this is something they have to think about as a third variable. They further controlled for marital status because young fatherhood was associated with unstable marriages in their sample. And marriage has been shown to be associated with decreased mortality in previous studies. That with these numbers in parentheses. That, that's a previous, uh, it's a citation to a previous study. Um, they also control the number of children because those who have uh, a child early in life tend to have more children. And it has been suggested uh, that this increase, uh, what? And it has been suggested it increases all-cause mortality. Oh, okay. Um, at least among women. So it applies to women. Maybe they'll apply to men. And then also region of residence was taken into account because of its close link with both fertility, timing, and mortality in Finland. Ah, okay, so it was Finland. That's, that's the country. So, um, so here you see that they, they looked in the previous literature, right? As I mentioned, all of these uh, numbers and parentheses are citations to previous studies that they read and, um, you know, thought to themselves, okay, well, if we don't control the influence of these variables, we won't know whether or not it's one of these variables that is actually driving the coalition that we're observing. So it's very, very important. That's why I have this as step one, is to review the literature. Figure out what other variables you're going to have to measure that you should expect to be related to um, the relationship that you're actually interested in and see if those variables uh, play a role. Um, again, can't, can't underestimate the importance of doing a thorough lit review. Um, okay, step two, use logical design principles. So what these authors also realize is there may be a genetic factor, right? What if there's some kind of uh, link between um, uh, uh, the genetic component and the age at which you um, decide to have kids and the age at which you die, right? So what they did, they, they used a, uh, uh, an elaborate design where they used um, – the, the brothers of the fathers that they studied as a control group. So they, they showed um, older, brother, uh, older brothers of younger fathers and younger brothers of older fathers as comparison groups to kind of uh, control for genetic influence and, and see whether those older or younger brothers uh, also died earlier. This is, this is you know, relatively going in depth, but um, you, know, you, you, you can often use data that are available in your own um, studies to try to control the influence of something that's relevant to your study. So in this case, genetics would certainly be important. Um, and, and this is, you know, I don't want to go into too much depth. If you want to check out this study, um, it's available for free online. It's the British Medical Journal. Um, and if you type in those authors' names, you'll find them. Um, anyway, so uh, that's step two. So now um, what I want to do is kind of go into a bit of a um, – a visual uh, uh, analysis of what all this, of how this all kind of uh, pans out, because uh, step three is going to be actually conducting the analysis in SPSS. So before we get to that, I just want to go through and look at um, how this all looks in a, a sort of visual way so that um, it might make a little more uh, sense. So you've got two variables. Right? You've got your independent variable and your dependent variable, synonymous with uh, predictor and outcome. All right? uh, and think of the area within each of these circles as the variation within each variable. So, so the, the independent variable, the predictor, has high values, low values, everything in between. Right? Same thing for the dependent variable, high values, low values, everything in between. So basically just distributions of, uh, of uh, data points. Um, and then we have the overlap between them, right? And so this green region here, you can think of as the correlation between the two variables. Here, you know, you see that about 50% of the data in the, uh, in the predictor um, is associated with, you know, a, a smaller chunk of the, of the outcome. But in any case, you would probably see, you know, a, a low to moderate correlation here. And this is all very, you know, these, these are not to scale, all right? These are just generic. Uh, um, uh, diagrams here. So now, okay, great. We've got these two. We've got this relationship. But now, what happens when we introduce a third variable? Okay. 
Now we've got a third variable. Also, they're, they're often called nuisance variables for the very reason that they can, you know, complicate our lives. Um, but they're actually really informative, right? As, as hopefully you're starting to see, uh, they are not necessarily a nuisance because they can help us unravel what's really going on. They're also called covariates. You might see the term covariate bandied about, and that's exactly what a nuisance variable is, exactly what a third variable is. Um, and I just want to also emphasize that just because I'm only showing one uh, nuisance variable here, you can have multiple ones. So you could have, you know, another nuisance variable popping up over here, um, overlapping with this nuisance variable. It could be over here, taking up another part of the uh, of the predictor variable, so on and so forth. I just want to keep things simple for the sake of this presentation, though, so I'm only going to do one. Okay, so now what we see is that the green area that we previously saw is going to shrink, right? You see that um, the, the correlation between the nuisance variable and the outcome variable is much stronger than what was even the green area before, right? So now we see that the, the, uh, the correlation that's left over for the, um, for, whoops, for the original uh, correlation that we saw is really, you know, much, much smaller. All of this in here has been taken up by our nuisance variable. So this purple shaded area represents the variance in the dependent variable accounted for by the nuisance variable, right? Um, and you can, again, note the decrease in the extent of the green area, that's the correlation between the predictor and the outcome, when the uh, nuisance variable is included. So if the nuisance variable basically overshadows that green area, there's no reason to believe that some kind of special preferential or unique relationship exists between uh, the, the two original variables that you um, were interested in studying. Now, there's a caveat here, which is that, you know, if your theory dictates that that nuisance variable actually is, it plays this role, then that's a different story. Um, and this is where we get into um, what's called mediation, um, where you're actually theorizing that, hey, guess what? You know, previous studies have found a correlation between this predictor and this outcome, but I actually think it's this third variable. So if that's your goal, then, you know, great. But that's a different story. Um, Okay, so th th this is this is basically this whole third variable problem summed up in a nutshell, right? You take that original correlation that you saw and realize that it gets whittled away by these third, fourth, fifth, however many variables. Let's look at a different example where this isn't as bleak of a picture, all right? So this time, you notice I switched them, right? The independent variable and the dependent variable, you can see the extent of that correlation is, is much bigger than before, right? And the nuisance variable shares uh, some relationship with the independent variable and the dependent variable. But this time, even if you include, uh, even, even, even if you chip away at the green area by including that third variable, that correlation that you originally were interested in remains, you know, relatively intact. So here, the purple area, again, represents the, uh, uh, the variance in the independent variable, dependent variable relationship um, that is accounted for by the nuisance variable, right? That's that purple area chipping away at it. But this time, it doesn't overshadow that green area, right? So this time, it does indicate that there is a reason to believe a special or preferential relationship exists between your predictor and your outcome. Okay, so that's good. And the reason that it's even better is that, you know, based on your lit review, right, you included that nuisance variable, um, for, for very good reasons. You knew, or well, you knew, you had good reason to believe, there's no way to know until you actually collect the data and analyze it, but um, you had very good reason to believe that uh, that nuisance variable would potentially affect the relationship. But even after you include it, you still see that your variable is still important, that that predictor relationship exists even after controlling for the nuisance variable, right? So, um, if we go back to the example of that fatherhood study, after they controlled for all of those different factors, right, um, you know, where you live, what your uh, genetic makeup is, what your, um, oh gosh, I forget, but you know, all those different variables, um, even after controlling for all of them, they still found that the age at which you become a father is related to the age at which you die. So at this point, 
it's like, okay, you know, we have to take this finding a little bit more seriously. And by the way, the British Medical Journal, top tier journal, they don't publish stuff that isn't good science. So, um, you know, don't take my word for it. Um, I mean, do, but, you know. Um, in any case, that, that effect was still there. So you always have to think what other nuisance variables are out there. Again, going back to that very first step, conducting a thorough lit review, understanding what variables to collect data on before you set out on collecting data. And this brings me to my next point, is choose your control variables wisely. Um, here we're going to get a little bit more into the uh, nitty gritty of um, data analysis. Don't worry, it's not going to get too heavy, but um, you should be aware of this where you want to, first of all, limit the number of control variables. Um, in multiple regression, for example, you need a ratio of at least 15 participants per variable, meaning that if you're analyzing three variables, you need at least 45 participants, right? Three times 15 is 45. Anything lower than that and, you know, your ability to, uh, to really get insight into the uh, relationships between your variables is going to be limited. Um, in studies where you have groups, so, you know, different types of treatment, you know, you got like an experimental treatment or a, a control group or a, you know, existing treatment, for example, you got three groups, that's this ANCOVA piece here, um, where you've got uh, a different type of um, study design where instead of continuous variables, you're analyzing the effect of a, of a categorical variable. Um, you should have no more than two or three control variables, and, and these are also called covariates. That's why it's called ANCOVA, that extra C in analysis of variance. You know, and ANOVA stands for analysis of variance. The C stands for covariance, when you have covariates, which is why that C is in there. Um, so you want to limit the number of covariates, and it's important to note that um, if you have more than those, you're really going to have um, some trouble in terms of interpretation unless you have uh, a really, really large sample size and if you can actually uh, interpret the influence of, you know, four different variables in a NOVA framework. It's kind of tough. Um, okay, and then there's also the different types of control variables. So uh, hopefully you've heard of, you know, the difference between like a, a categorical variable, an ordinal variable, and a continuous variable. Um, if not, you know, feel free to ask, but unless there are questions, I'm not going to go into that. Um, in multiple regression, you can have either categorical or continuous covariates, or also called control variables. Those are synonyms, by the way, control variable and uh, covariate. Uh, and in an ANOVA framework, they need to be continuous. The reason being that if in an ANOVA framework you have a categorical covariate, that just becomes um, uh, a factor or an independent variable. Um, you know, another categorical variable, basically, that you can um, use as a, a, a factor in a so-called factorial ANOVA. Anyway, long story short, if you're going to be doing an ANOVA with a covariate, it has to be continuous. Something like age or, um, you know, something that has, you know, goes from zero to 100, for example. Okay, so um, before I ramble too much about this, Let's move into actually conducting an analysis, and I'll show you how uh, how this can kind of play out in SPSS, where you include versus don't include a third variable. Okay, so multiple regression, we can be talking about linear regression, where you have a continuous dependent variable. It can be logistic regression, where you have a categorical dependent variable, and you can use continuous, categorical, or both in terms of uh, predictors or independent variables, and nuisance variables. So they can all be kind of uh, included, very versatile methodology, very popular um, in psychology especially. So um, what I want to do is give you a bare bones example um, using SPSS. And um, you see there's a little um, footnote there. Uh, the reason being that uh, I'm, I'm glossing over all the preliminary groundwork that you have to lay down before you run uh, an actual uh, statistical analysis. Oh, hang on one second. Um, uh, Heather, I saw that you asked me a, a couple of questions. Let's let's um, revisit those um, 
uh, in an email because uh, no one else can see those. So I don't want to, I realize I missed them earlier, but um, I don't want to have to backtrack too much. Okay. Um, if we have time, I'll come back to them at the end. Um, okay, so uh, again, there are, there is, the majority of your work when running uh, regressions and, and any kind of analysis comes before you actually run the final analysis. So um, you, you can look at this data set, uh, you can download it and kind of play around with it if you want. And I also made some other videos here where um, I show all the preliminary groundwork that has to be laid in terms of you know, running assumption checks, making sure that your model fits the data well, that everything is as it should be before you actually interpret the results of a regression analysis. So what I'm doing here in this presentation is only um, going through uh, what SPSS shows us and the influence that a third variable can have on an analysis. So um, if you are going to, you know, download this data set and, and uh, you know, recreate the analysis, just keep that in mind. Okay, so with that little caveat, um, the question that we're going to be addressing here is, do stressful life events predict the number of visits to a health professional? And again, we've got two variables, right? Number of stressful life events and the number of visits to a health professional. So these are continuous variables. Um, the literature review and professional experience, and you know, this is just, you know, an imaginary scenario here, but let's just say that the lit review and the professional experience that we have uh, leads us to believe that physical and mental health symptoms may be related to the number of doctor's visits as well. So we're going to control for those. And um, what we start out with, remember, I, I said that correlations are important, right? So you can ask SPSS for uh, a correlation matrix between all of these variables. You've got your um, Oh, where's my mouse? Uh, you've got your stressful life events, you've got your mental health symptoms, physical health symptoms, and then visits to health professionals, right? And then you can see that they're all correlated with the other variables um, along the diagonal. Uh, when it comes to looking at correlation matrices, you don't need to um, look at both halves because it's it's a symmetrical matrix. So uh, to make our lives easier, I'm just going to you know blank that out. But here you can see that, um, so for example, stressful life events are correlated with visits to health professionals. Okay, so this is our original question of interest, right? It's like, okay, woohoo, significant correlation, right? The, the more stressful life events someone has, the more visits to a health professional they um, actually uh, make. So what we also see, though, is that stressful life events is correlated with mental health symptoms, and it's also correlated with physical health symptoms. So that's going to be important down the line because you'll notice that uh, mental health symptoms are significantly correlated with visits to health professionals. And the same goes for physical health symptoms down here. See that? So now, how do we make sense of all this? Given that these correlations all exist, um, what happens to that link between stressful life events and visits to health professionals. Well, let's look at it. When you run a regression in SPSS, um, you get a bunch of different output. So what I'm doing here is uh, just selecting snippets of it. Um, and I'm, I'm using these snippets to kind of highlight the pieces of information that are most important. Um, when you run a regression in SPSS, you'll get a whole bunch of different output. I don't want to have to sift through that. So I just um, pasted it here into this um, uh, into this SPSS window. Now, if you look at that other presentation um, I just pointed out in the um, in the previous slide, uh, there I go through all the details of how to enter variables, how to sift through the output, all that. But for here, um, let's just focus on what's centrally important. This model output that uh, we're looking at here, this model summary, as it's called in SPSS, only has uh, stressful life events as uh, as a predictor and visits to health professionals as an outcome. So this is, you know, remember remember our uh, little Venn diagram? That's this relationship here that we're looking at. And as you can see, the correlation, like we saw, 0.287, just like in the correlation matrix. Um, and then uh, you can see that the uh, R square, which is the amount of variance accounted for in the dependent variable, is about 8.2%. So 
this is a significant effect, all right? Which is great because it tells us that this is a significant relationship, which we already knew from the correlation uh, matrix that we looked at previously. Now, when you control for mental health symptoms and physical health symptoms, what you're doing is you're entering variables in what are called blocks. And I, I will actually show you um, how that's done in a couple of slides. So don't freak out about what that might mean. What happens is that in you see that there are two models now, right? There's, there's a line that I highlighted in purple, which is model one, and a line that I highlighted in green, which is model two. Model one is those nuisance variables, right? We got mental health symptoms and physical health symptoms in model one. You see it's got this little superscript A. That's because in, mo in, uh, in model one, the only predictors are mental health symptoms and physical health symptoms. And you can see that they account for 19, well, you want to look at adjusted R score, 19.1% um, of the variance in um, doctor's visits. So that's, you know, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, and then what we're looking at is in model two, this, this green line down here, uh, we not only have the nuisance variables in the model, but we also have stressful life events added now. You see this, this uh, letter B is consistent with what we've got up here. In model two, uh, the predictors are now all three of our variables, right? So now you can see that uh, when you have all three in there, you're now accounting for 21.4%. So again, this is not to scale, right? <laughs> um, because the, the stressful life events variable is only adding another 2.4% of, uh, of variance that's explained. So you go from 19.5%, you add another 2.4% and you get to 21.4%. You can check the math, but you know that's all there. So what's interesting is that, okay, even though it's only 2.4% that's added by looking at stressful life events, it is still significant. So adding that variable in is still, it's still important. So notice if you're only looking at correlations, right? If you're only looking at correlations, you're looking at 0.287. It's like, wow, that's huge. But when you take into account that these other variables are playing a role, I mean, you're really only adding a correlation of like 0.05 or so. Um, what SPSS also lets us do is look at precisely, oh, well, actually, before I get to that, yeah, we, we, can, we can make a conclusion here that stress accounts for a significant amount of variance in the number of doctor's visits, 2.4%, after controlling for physical and mental health. Okay, so we got that. Um, but we would have overestimated the importance, right? We would have said, oh, no, it's closer to like, um, you know, 10% um, if we didn't take into account mental and physical health. So um, what SPSS also does is let us look at um, what the contribution of each variable is to that correlation pattern. So if you look all the way on the right, uh, where's my little laser pointer? Okay. Um, you see that there are zero order correlations and there are part correlations, right? So if you look back to the correlation matrix, we know that the correlation between physical health symptoms, right, up here, and the outcome, which is doctor's visits, is 0.256. Between mental health symptoms and doctor's visits, it's 0.440. And again, between stressful life events, uh, and doctor's visits is 0.287. So that's nothing new. We already knew that. But when you look at the part correlations, this column here tells you the correlation if you take into account the existence of the other variables. So you see that um, the stressful life events gets chopped down from 0.287 to 0.155. Wow. It gets cut in half, basically. I said 10%, but... Um, that was just mental math. I got it wrong. 50, 0.155 is the correlation. And if you take 0.155 times 0.155, which is, um, you know, the, the variance that it accounts for, you, you would get 0.024 or 2.4%. So it's very important to note how the correlation between a variable and, you know, a predictor variable and an outcome changes when you include other variables. And so this part correlations column tells us that. And again, um, all this information here, this is uh, 
this is again the same thing that we looked at um, previously in this model summary, except now instead of a summary, we're getting all the specific coefficients, right? Remember, we're still looking at model one, right? And model two, except we're breaking it down by each individual variable. So again, SPSS gives you this output along with a bunch of other stuff, but here this is the most important part. Um, that it tells you the, the relative impact of each one of your variables uh, on the outcome. So here we see, you know, you've got your significance column where we now know that physical health symptoms are not contributing to that significant uh, effect. Mental health symptoms are, and stressful life events are as well. And, you know, you can look at your beta coefficients and see that they're, you know, positive, they're pretty big. And just very quickly, the beta coefficient tells you that for every one, the standardized beta coefficient here, you've also got an unstandardized beta, but I only look at standardized beta because it's more pertinent. That for every one uh, standardized unit of mental health symptoms, you get 0.4, you know, 0 0.39, 0 0.4 standardized unit increase in doctor's visits. Uh, and for stressful life events, it's only 0.17 of an increase for, for each uh, standardized increase in stressful life events, um, you can expect uh, a relatively small increase in the number of doctor's visits. So when you look at these uh, all these numbers, and again, remember the part correlations and the zero order correlations, you start to see the relative importance of all these different variables. So your conclusion here might be that mental health symptoms are the strongest predictor of doctor's visits, followed by stressful life events. And then, you know, you would go into much more detail when you're reporting your uh, findings, but uh, you have all this more, you know, fine-grained, more sort of um, eloquent way to talk about your data rather than just reporting, hey, guess what? My, um, my stressful life events measure is correlated at 0.29 with, um, with doctor's visits and, and call it a day. You can see that there are, you know, changes in that relationship based on um, including other known variables that are important. So um, I mentioned, you know, how you do this in SPSS very quickly. Uh, you'll notice that uh, when you go to uh, run a linear regression SPSS, you'll get this, um, uh, this output here uh, on the top left. And what SPSS does is it has this little window here. You might not ever notice this, but it's block one of one and then that's where you input your independent variables. Um, so you put your dependent variable in here, time DRS, it's the number of times you go to a doctor, um, and then the independent variables are mental health and physical health, so you put those in, and then what you do is you would click next, this little button here, um, and what it then does is it shows up block two of two now, and then this is where that model two comes from. And then you take your actual variable that you're interested in, which, you know, in our case is stress, and you pop it into the independent box. And that's how you get those inputs for model one and model two. Block one and block two are synonymous with model one and model two. You know, these, um, these lines here, right? So now you see you got physical health, mental health in model one, and in model two you got physical health, mental health, but now you also add stressful life events. And again, going back, this is where you've got model one and model two except just, you know, super summarized. And it tells you whether or not your, your uh, how much uh, variance in addition is accounted for by model two, which, you know, this more detailed table doesn't tell you. So, okay, that's how you would do it in SPSS. Again, I can't stress this enough. This is the very last part of an analysis, but it is um, uh, something that, you will eventually get to if you're running this kind of analysis. Okay, um, uh, we have a couple of minutes. Um, I'll go over ANCOVA very quickly. Um, and uh, an ANOVA framework is where you have a categorical predictor or predictors, something like age group. You know, you got young, you got you got a, a group of people who are young, group of people who are old. Gender is another variable that is typically um, uh, analyze. You can have, you know, men and women. Um, if you have uh, a continuous independent variable, for example, and it violates statistical assumptions, um, you know, a bell curve, then what you can do is uh, you can dichotomize it. So let's say you have age, right, and you have a, 
you know, a, a ton of people who are like between 20 and 30, but then only a handful of people who are like 30 to 40, okay? Um, and you want to analyze it as a continuous variable, but, you know, it might make more sense to just, you know, cut them in half and see, okay, here's my young group, here's my old group, you make a 50-50 split, and now you have a categorical variable, all right? So same thing, uh, I have another example up here of physical health, fine. Um, so you, again, as I mentioned earlier, you have to have continuous nuisance variables or covariates, and uh, in a ANOVA, your dependent variable is continuous. So uh, I also mentioned this, that is ANOVA with that extra C. So here's what ANCOVA does. Um, basically, if you're running an ANOVA, you see here that we've got three groups, A1, A2, and A3, and they're represented by squares, circles, and a black circle, right? So you see that there are uh, some imaginary data here, all measured on a dependent variable. You see that group A3 has a bunch of higher values. Group A2 has, you know, a few values that are somewhere in the middle. And then group A1 has all these lower values. But you see that there's still a bunch of overlap between them, right? Um, and an ANOVA would simply say, okay, are there significant differences between these three groups? There is a lot of overlap, so you might not be able to detect that effect. Now, if you run an ANCOVA, if you include a covariate, what happens is you end up with this third variable here, right? So every data point that you had before, right? So this person on this line is here, and you can see that they scored about an 11 on this covariate variable. Uh, you know, um, let's see, this person here, uh, they scored about a 16. So you see that they get spread out, and now you can start to see that there's more of a pattern. Um, and so that's, that's basically what ANCOVA does. Is it lets you sort of uh, sift out those differences between um, your groups by using that third covariate to um, account for any additional differences. So the way that you would do it in SPSS, I, again, we don't have time, but in SPSS you go to Analyze, General Linear Model, Univariate, that's that drop-down menu, and you'll get this window, right? So you put your dependent variable in, you put your fixed, your, your <clears throat> hello. Come on, mouse, where are you? Oh my gosh, I've lost my mouse, where is it? Okay, found it. Um, right, so you put your dependent variable in, you put your uh, independent variable or variables in, and then you've got a box for covariates. Right, um, and so very quickly, um, what we have is uh, I put together this graph using a different data set where we can look at the difference between males and females. Males are the blue group, females are the uh, green group, and um, their lines of best fit according to this covariate. So we're, we're interested in reading score on the y-axis according to uh, the sex of the uh, of the student. It, this is high school data. Um, and what we have is we can try to account for writing score, right? Use writing score as a covariate. What's interesting is when you actually run this analysis, uh, gender is not a significant predictor of reading score, all right? But if you uh, account for writing score, the difference does end up being significant, which is interesting. So just another example of how um, using a covariate can help you, uh, you know, discern what's going on out in the real world. Um, so if you were, for example, designing an intervention, you wouldn't necessarily want to give uh, uh, girls more uh, reading interventions. You might want to think about um, giving them writing interventions because you can see that depending on writing score, uh, that's where the real uh, difference may lie, which then reveals that the, the gender effect becomes significant. I don't have the SPSS output here, um, but that is that was the outcome of the analysis. Um, in any case, let's let's move on to questions. I know that some of you may have to go. We're just at our time limit, um, but uh, let me unmute everyone. And if you have a question, please fire away. Uh, if not, there were a couple of questions. Um, that uh, were asked to me um, directly in the chat window, so I'll, I'll tackle those if, um, if there aren't any other ones. But please, fire away. Okay. Um, 
in that case, oh, my pleasure. Uh, in that case, let me get to these questions that were asked uh, in private. What if you are doing research that doesn't have a lot of concomitant data because it is relatively new? Okay, that's a great question. Um, let's go back to that slide. Uh, actually, here, this, this way. Um, if you don't have a lot of previous data to uh, sort of understand what to do, then uh, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, one is that you're actually doing more of an exploratory study. So establishing the existence of the correlations becomes your job. Uh, what's interesting is that, you know, this example I gave with, um, you know, the whole uh, fatherhood uh, study, they had a lot of previous literature to, to base their study off of. Um, but all of these previous studies that they cite did not, right? So you see here that they, they talk about um, educational level is correlated with fertility timing and mortality. So those two studies establish those links. And maybe those, if you look at those previous studies, they um, uh, started from scratch. Maybe they had some kind of reason to expect that that would be the case. Who knows? But at the very beginning of conducting research, it would be up to you to establish that correlation. However, um, for uh, the purposes of something like a dissertation, you're doing such an extensive lit review that you're going to be able to kind of think about this in your sleep and be able to predict just using you know critical thinking um, and uh, just your own opinion at that point to select variables that you think will be uh, relevant to your analysis. Um, does that address uh, your question? Okay, excellent. Um, and for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, the, the chat box, she said yes. <laughs> um, okay, uh, now the, the other question that came up along the way was, um, this actually helps us to not make overstatements in our results. Yes, that is exactly right. Um, doing these kinds of analyses definitely helps you not overstate the results. Um, hopefully when we got to this uh, uh, section on looking at um, what happens to the, uh, to the correlations when you account for the other variables, you know, this part correlations column, um, that's where you start to see that the importance of that initial variable um, really has to be downplayed if you're accounting for other variables that may be important. Um, okay, um, any other questions on the basis of that? Or anything at all? Okay, if not, then um, again, uh, please feel free to revisit this presentation on our YouTube channel, you can see that you can just search for NCADE on YouTube, and the first thing that pops up is the NCADE YouTube channel. Um, you'll find this presentation there. Uh, you can also contact uh, me at this uh, email address here, uh, nk.me at the chicagoschool.edu. Stop by my office or give me a call on the phone um, to discuss your research study, um, and we can uh, go from there. Thank you very much.